clearly the learning curve is a little steep, especially at the beginning with 181. Um, tell us about your experience in understanding the bigger picture for incorporating off-site water reuse, and what one lesson from that experience do you want the audience to know? So Kelly, Piper, and then Amanda, Salesforce. Salesforce, Amanda. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> Early on, <laughs> so we were the first in the city to decide on the gray water system, and so there was a grant from PUC, and that was uh, very intriguing to us, and it was kind of determined on or determined by the amount of gallons of water we'd save a year. Um, early on, you can't predict how your building's going to occupy. So ours is a mixed-use building; we have a full tenant now. Uh, and we're selling condo units. So this, we are talking a little bit before, it, it takes water to feed the machine because it doesn't work without the water. So it's hard now, the lessons that we've learned is the commissioning part of it. We need water to commission the system and we've committed to saving so many gallons of water. Um, and then everything's low flow because everyone here has done such a great job of reducing all the flow, but we need water. <laughs> and so it's kind of like a make money, or it takes money to make money. Thing. Um, we need the water and we need to get people into the building so that we can turn it on. So we selected this, uh, I think it was 2014, so we're in 18 and we haven't, we haven't turned it on yet. Um, and with that, realizing that we have a, fu a full tenant, uh, but they're doing their TI build out through the year. We're going to move our occupants into the residential, but that won't produce enough water to start it. So we really anticipated on commissioning this earlier, and instead we had to take a different path and educate ourselves on how to bypass the system at, in the beginning until we get the people in to commission it. So commissioning startup will will likely happen more heavily on our chief engineering staff that's already in the building and running it than the construction team that built it because uh, although they'll be around for warranty and, and hanging around finishing TI, by the time we get this thing up and running, we're going to have a whole new different team and it's been such a long process that we have a lot of turnover within that time just because, you know, years go by. So we continually educate the new teams on what we're doing um, and it's kind of an ongoing process. So I think I didn't forecast any of that. I'm lucky I'm still here that I'm talking to everyone new. I'm and smiling. Uh, it's, it's, it's still exciting and we can't wait to turn it on, but it's like the toy we've had forever <laughs> under the tree and we can't, <laughs> we can't make it happen. Um, and, and then just the new things with the city and just and having um, full understanding. I wish we would have partnered a little more throughout the process and got together you know, every quarterly or something, just to kind of talk about how it's going to happen. Because the PUC and Paula that I, I worked with on the grant is not the team that I'm working with to commission it. So um, I didn't know that, but, you know, as we go through it, we're, we'll, we'll write some cliff notes out to everyone, <laughs> hand out an easier path. But uh, that's kind of just the process that we're going through. So um, lessons learned. It's over there. Um, I could say so many things. Uh, one lesson for me uh, has been the, uh, this concept of renewable water. And I uh, always used to tell people you can't get to lead platinum without um, renewables like wind and solar and geothermal. And in a, a high rise building, those are not um, always possible or th they, they won't give you as much of a contribution. Um, and so now we have this concept of renewable water, which was sort of a, um, a new one for me, but it's it, it's great to see LEED version 4.0 prioritize water a little bit more um, relative to its focus on energy um, and, uh, and that with on-site water reuse, you actually, that can move the needle between a, a mid to high level gold and into so that's exciting. Um, other lessons learned, I could say so many things, Kyle. Maybe you should just cut me off and we can move on. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda Salesforce, you're next. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of lessons learned. Um, mostly good. Um, we, you know, one of the big things really that kind of is right in front of our face, but we didn't initially think about is we're a tech company, a cloud company, and now we're going to own black water infrastructure. Like we own tanks and we own 
really random things. <laughs> and what the, what we had our legal team negotiating and, and looking into what is the risk associated with owning tanks and what if, you know, we hope it, nothing goes wrong, but what if it does? And what does that liability look at? So there was a lot of new areas our company in general had to really investigate on insurance. How do you insure a Blackwater system as a tech company? Again, didn't initially go into my mind, but of course we have to look into these types of things. Um, so really managing the risk of owning the infrastructure, insuring the infrastructure, while also, you know, it, we always knew we want, you know, we knew we wanted to do this and it was a clear leadership position for us, but there's so many other factors you have to look at before you can kind of run full steam ahead. And then really around the, uh, the, the grant process actually really, um, was, uh, difficult, <laughs> not because the city, the city was great, held our hand and everything like that, but just fight, you know, there's a lot of, um, I never thought trying to find a person within a 30,000 uh, employee organization that would have to post the benefits ordinance on our website. I mean, that took Alan from Urban Power and I months to figure out who the person was that would even do that. Um, so really random things like that you don't think are going to take a lot of time, but are these regulatory requirements that we have to make sure that we um, handle. So I kind of found out that actually some of the smaller pieces ended up being the ones that took um, the most amount of time as opposed to the bigger items were, were pretty straightforward. So um, I would say biggest lesson learned is pay attention to the small pieces because they can really <laughs> hold you up if you're not careful, uh, like posting a benefits ordinance on your website. Uh, who knew? <laughs> and making sure that's constantly updated. We didn't have a mechanism in place. The city requirement says that needs to be updated every year or something like that. And so we then had to set up a process with that team that they evaluate and update that every year so that we're never in violation of that particular. So you're setting up a lot of these really, you know, what starts off as small, an actual uh, process for the company. Thank you. Piper, <laughs> Urban Fabric is currently leading the Salesforce project team or the Salesforce Blackwater project team. What are some of the collective challenges and successes <laughs> for this project? Okay, again, there's so many things Salesforce I can Salesforce is in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All good <Come> things. <laughs> um, well, this has been a, it, it continues to be an amazing, collaborative, um, great team to work with. So um, not just because the two men are sitting next to you, but uh, um, I think the, the most challenging one from as a project manager, which is the role that I have on this, is um, figuring out how this works as a retrofit and uh, tying it to base building. And, you know, a lot of that is it's figure outable, right? But if it hasn't been done um, in involving uh, the right folks at the right time and and um, and designing for failure as much as designing for success. So uh, looking at all the different scenarios and what could go wrong and then um, safeguarding um, what could happen with fail safe valves and critical control points, et cetera. Um, what else could I say? Successes. So I, I do think that our team collaboration, this uh, public-private partnership that Amanda um, of Salesforce uh, talked about, and also the um, the tenant-owner relationship is a real triumph. It's unusual to have a building owner, a Boston Properties support a master tenant putting in a Blackwater system that supports the entire building and own it when it impacts other tenants. That's um, pretty amazing. And it, that comes down to um, close team collaboration and transparency. Um, I guess, so Kyle's um, going through here. Uh, as a retrofit, we had to figure out where this was going to go. And uh, we knew it would go into the sub-grade levels. It ended up being a stacked 40-foot by 40-foot box in parking levels P2 and P3. Um, so you see it takes up uh, eight parking spaces on each floor, or um, 32 if you have stackers. Um, and uh, that ended up, you know, the demand for parking has gone down, so Boston Properties was open to that. And here you see the um, the rooms themselves. They're rooms and tanks, so <laughs> it's not much of a room. It's a lot of equipment. Um, and I, I think that, for me, is the most challenging part of the project, because if this was designed into base building, it probably wouldn't be two stories. It would be designed to be possibly even toured um, and uh, less compact. 
that's about all. Oh, we, oh, well, okay. So yeah. <laughs> those are nope. the tank sizes. I'm going and back now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Piper, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, I can speak to those other slides if you like. Yeah, no, that's okay. We'll, we'll keep go. We'll keep moving forward. Uh, okay, so. Um, Salesforce Amanda <laughs> and Kelly. Describe what you needed to give approval on moving forward with your respective projects. Was it personally viewing an in-use system? Was it the advice of your experts? Was it lead points? Was it the technology? What was it? I think a multiple choice. Kelly. E. Yeah. All <laughs> e, all of the above. Uh, yeah, definitely all of the above. Um, it took definitely um, seeing is believing, and I kind of touched on that when we went down under to Australia, and um, <laughs> but we uh, <laughs> we learned. Th thank you for clarifying that. I was really wondering <laughs> where we were going felt, down yeah, under. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so we we learned a lot um, from the consultant st side of it. I think. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit about seeing because I the actual monitoring because I think that was a big sales thing for us is what if some th somebody dumps you know whatever down the drain and this now we have this huge problem so you have to ask yourself you run all these scenarios of what ifs and just like Amanda was talking about of the risks that you're under um, when I saw the monitoring at um, Aquacell in Australia and how it's constantly you know 24 hours a day it's watching if something gets poured down, it automatically stops and bypasses. So those assurances were big to know because it was really asking the questions of what if everything goes wrong? Who's at risk of these high, you know, these human beings that are in the building and is everyone safe and, and fine and how does that notify? I think um, we just recently sell, um, signed up our sales agreement, although it had been um, outlined for a couple of years, we just kind of got to the to the um, execution portion of that. And I think that monitoring is important and I think it's going to continue to change. It was like you were saying, you don't want to do send a sample, wait three days. You know, it has to be real time. And I'm in agreement with the changes that were made in terms of monitoring that, you know, in real time. Um, <laughs> well, Thank you. I, we already had ours, so sorry for everyone else. <laughs> we were already monitoring. No, I, I'm, I can't. No, I don't, because if I wouldn't be the same if I. <laughs> no, I do believe we should be monitoring in real time. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's been. It's. I laugh because we're right about to open and we're in the heart of, you know, all of these things right now. So. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of running through all of the things in my head, but uh, definitely seeing is believing was my biggest thing, and who did I have to answer to? I'm Jay's privately held company, and he always wants to build at the highest standard, so um, it was more of a directive, like, go get the best building you can get and be ahead of the game. So when we get thrown into those kinds of things, it's like, you got to jump in and swim and try to figure it out. And not, you go from never knowing you're going to know about water reuse to like everything you could <laughs> know about it. So, or try to. Um, so. And, and <laughs> if I remember correctly, the water reuse piece actually kicked you over into Lee Platinum, right? Well, for us, like I was saying, we had that list and um, it definitely we needed it to become Lee Platinum. And we were early enough on, as Michael was saying, that we could. Um, you know, install the hatches, uh, you know, on the on the level above. Um, some of the downsides to that is it has been sitting, so we need to redo filters, you know, that are that aren't cheap. That you know, the stuff that we're kind of going to have to commission it twice and look at it. Um, and I'm wondering if there was a better way to do that where you don't have to put all of the infrastructure in, but you can get mm. some of the infrastructure in and then kind of finish it off later with the smaller parts mm. and pieces so that it doesn't sit and feel like it's old. Still wrapped up under the tree. Yeah. So, are you are you doing this to me yet? You no, want me to keep on. going? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You, you have another thing? You want to hear more? <laughs> um, no, I, I'll let you know when we turn it on. But I, I think it would be a cool thing for Michael to talk more about how we're sampling water. Like, 
that's going to be everyone's next thing, is right? Yeah. Is there was no way in San Francisco at the time when we we took this risk, there wasn't really any um, competent person that's going to come out and be that testing agent. So we knew that was a path that had to happen concurrently. Um, one that Bill was working on that, you know, of who's going to test that water and who's going to be that responsible person. Can it be our chief engineer? They're going to train on it. Um, and in where we kind of come out, came out in the end is something I think it's better for them to talk about. But um, those were all questions we really didn't have answers to going into it. We're going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, Amanda, Salesforce Amanda. Well, I said yes right away. Of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, Salesforce is very unique. Our CEO, Mark Benioff, you may have heard of him, um, he consistently says publicly, you know, in even to us, that the business of business is improving the state of the world. And when you work for a company that that's your mantra, it already kind of paves the way for innovation and doing the right thing. Um, so that was, that was the best part, really, was... Um, we want to be great stewards to our home here in San Francisco, a water-stressed area. So to us, it was really a no-brainer that we needed to do something in water leadership and really as a as building this tower, and we have other large presence, obviously, in that area, we, we knew we needed to do something. Um, so that, that was the easy part. It was just a matter of what. And Blackwater had been floating around for several years. Um, but sometimes, right, you also need timing. Um, you need the right people and you need right things going on. So I, I stepped in nearly two and a half years ago with Patrick. Um, and we decided, I think it was my first week at the job, and we decided we were going to run full steam ahead with this. And at that point, we had a really supportive real estate team that just also saw the value in cr establishing this water leadership. Um, and really making sure. So lead was actually never in mind. We had actually set the lead strategy that we were going to go for lead V4 commercial interiors platinum certification well before we knew if Blackwater was going to be approved from a funding level. Um, so Blackwater has though been a really great add on on top as you know things start to settle out in the lead certification. <laughs> you drop a point here or there. Um, we have you know it has definitely helped, but we were going to go for lead platinum regardless of Blackwater. Um, we were kind of uh, doing them in tandem. Um, so in order to get approval, again, it goes back to this education. So um, we, the first thing we needed to do was really be connected with experts. Um, as much as I think I know about water reuse, I am certainly not an expert, and we really needed to find a company. Uh, we were really lucky that um, Brendan from USGBC, I think he's sitting over right here, connected us with Urban Fabric and told us uh, about the, the great work that they had done in this space and really influencing on the policy side. Um, so when we met Bill and Kyle, um, it was kind of a no-brainer for us that we really wanted them to be on this journey with us and to help us figure this out. So they really joined the team immediately and helped us educate, 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 educate. I don't, can't tell you how many PowerPoint presentations we gave. Uh, we did the whole thing. We took, uh, we took them I to believe the, the exact count was 3,124. <laughs> yeah, something like that. That sounds about right. Um, obviously, we had the wonderful Bill Worthen helping us with his passion and really, um, he really in a way ignited our own internal leadership and everything and got them feeling like they had a sense of ownership and excitement about it. And then, um, you know, we did the, the usual. We took every, we did a lot of tours of the SFPUC. They were so gracious every time we needed to bring, whether it was Boston properties or just different stakeholders. Seeing was really an important part of that, and being able to ask those questions. Um, we also, and it gets into the next question, so I won't go too much, but we also made sure that our director of facilities was engaged from the very beginning. So he was part of the original approval process. So when you start to be able to kind of lift under the hood, ask those questions, things like that. Um, we toyed with the idea of going to Australia, down under, but we didn't. Um, we you really, <laughs> yet. we'd really seen enough case studies for us uh, that we knew the technology would work and everything like that. We just had to adapt it to our local, um, you know, jurisdiction. So for us, we just, I mean, we just kind of, we're going to figure it out. We're going to do it. We're going to be a leader and we're going to make it happen one way or another. So it was pretty... <laughs> It's pretty easy in that sense, but again, a lot of time in educating people, having them be aware, and getting them on board and excited to collaborate on the project um, was really how we got the approval. And then one day they said, yay, yes, you can do it. It's so important to have ownership or leadership that is you know, excited about uh, doing this kind of project because it is not an easy lift, right? Um, and that education is a really, really important piece. 
Um, Michael, what are the most important things to consider when selecting which technology and provider you want to bring uh, onto your project? Great question, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> we did not talk about this before at all. This is completely... Yeah, uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my business development hat off right now. Um, Aquacell provides treatment systems and that's what I'm going to push. But when it comes to selecting for a project... Uh, the right technology but also the right provider the most important thing you can do is find somebody that has experience and a track record um, I think you'll hear from the two examples given today these projects have been running now for multiple years you want a provider who has been around is and is going to stay around uh, there's a lot of fly-by-night companies we call them cowboys of the industry who can come in and they look at it and they go it's a bunch of pipes it's a bunch of pumps I can do this um, very important to find somebody who has a track record. Uh, and as you heard from Kelly, you know, we took um, project teams to Australia to show them our track record, to show them systems that have been operating for 15 years. Um, and the reason that it's so important is as you move through these projects, uh, you're dealing with so many different people, so many different specialities, and you need to be able to communicate to all of them, but also understand their concerns and understand um, where they're coming from on a project and the way you, you gain that knowledge is through experience. Um, so experienced provider is very important. When it comes to the technology, there's lots of different technologies out there. You can do you know, MBRs, MABRs, um, advanced filtration, read beds, uh, all sorts of stuff out there. Really what it, you need is a, a skilled team who can assess your project and what your project's looking for and the benefits of each system and then select which technology makes the most sense. Um, you know, MBRs are great because they take up a little footprint uh, in a urban environment like San Francisco, that's very important at saving space. Uh, they use energy though. If you have the space, a reed bed is great because um, they use very little energy, but they're going to take up a lot of space and that can increase your construction costs as well. So the technology side of it, you just need to investigate, get a team who understands what they're doing, understands the nuances of all of them. Don't always believe the salespeople. Um, that's always important. And that's where on these projects, someone like Urban Fabric comes in. Uh, they can represent present the client's interest but know enough in the industry that they can ask the right questions um, and assess your options I guess is the the main takeaway from that um, there's lots of different things you can do out there great thank you Michael um, so we definitely want to leave enough time for questions and we're starting to run a little bit low so um, you all represent the spectrum of stakeholders from your perspective, what does a team need to consider in planning for the long-term operations and maintenance of an on-site water reuse system? Um, initially, we budgeted two minutes each, so one minute each. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, go. go. <laughs> um, I, well, I feel like I kind of covered these things, and, and yeah. so I don't want to take a lot of time if someone else has something to say, something more to offer, because I think talking about the testing is important. <laughs> Yeah, and I also talked about stakeholder engagement. It's really important to identify the roles and responsibilities of all parties involved, and that was a, a big role for us, <laughs> identifying those roles and responsibilities for for the team. Um, and we use basic tools like a, a RACI or a responsibility matrix and got everyone in the room and uh, looked at all of the options because it's um, there are actually quite a few different um, uh, ways that the, the team in the O&M could move forward and who could do what. And so we looked at what made the most sense for this project. So responsibility. So from our perspective, we have about 80 plus projects in various stages of permitting, construction, um, and operation. And for us, it's really essential that these projects continue to be operated and maintained, not only for protection of public <laughs> <laughs> protection of um, yeah. I can't hear. <laughs> Where are they? Um, for the protection, so it's important for the protection of public health, um, and as well <laughs> as our um, long-term conservation savings that we anticipate from these projects. 
and then I'll put on my regulator hammer hat for a second. Um, you know, so we passed our non-potable water ordinance in 2012, and it's evolved over time and been amended. And in 2015, it actually became a mandatory requirement for um, new development projects of commercial, mixed-use, or multifamily that they actually have to install and operate an on-site water treatment system in San Francisco. So these are for buildings over 250,000 square feet. Um, so since we, since these particular buildings have to install and operate a system, they're actually given a potable water use allocation. So we know from their water budget application that they submit, we know what their potential or anticipated on-site non-potable wa water supplies will be. And then we know what that additional water, potable water, is needed for that building. So if this particular project is not continuing to maintain their system and they continue to draw more and more potable water into their building, um, they're actually subject to excess use charges equal to three times the water and sewer rate. So there's a financial incentive for these mandatory projects to continue to operate their systems. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, right? Yeah. Th thanks, Amanda. You're welcome. <laughs> Michael? Uh, so I, I think the important thing is when you're looking at the ongoing operations is, um, and Piper touched on this, uh, developing the roles and responsibilities. For me, it's making sure that ownership understands what it takes for a system to operate. Um, getting buy-in from ownership so that they understand what's going to happen having a treatment system in their basement because these things operate 24 hours a day every single day of the year. Even if there's a chance of something going wrong, you know, half a percent of a chance it's going to occur sometime during a year. So knowing uh, what can happen with the systems, having belts and braces in place to make sure that if something goes wrong, the actual risk to the building is mitigated. Uh, having multiple steps of disinfection and barriers to prevent uh, any issues happening should you know, your UV systems bulb burn out you have something in place and then you have the ability to call ownership because you can't be there all the time and them to understand, okay, I've got a system. Yes, I can go down and have a look at it. Um, so ownership from the whole team is probably the most important thing that you can prepare for for the long-term operations because these systems are designed to operate for the life of the building. Uh, so you need to prepare for every single such event that could occur. Um, yeah, so for us... Um so we have a very large internal facilities team at Salesforce, um, which is great. <laughs> uh, there's a building coordinator for every building and things like that. So the first thing we did from day one was make sure that our head of facilities for our HQ region was part of every conversation. And ultimately, really elevating his questions to the top, uh, so designing for operations and making sure because when it's all said and done and we build this thing, they're actually going to be operating it a lot longer than it's going to take us to build it, hopefully. And uh, and so it was really important to learn kind of lessons from typical build out and design is you really need to bring operations from in from the very beginning. And so he was very excited and, and on board, but it really allowed us to consider a lot of questions, design and plan for things that we may not necessarily as the project team kind of consider. We kind of would have looked at that later down the road. Um, in addition to that, um, they weren't afraid to kind of roll their sleeves up and learn. And, and, and again, none of them have experienced testing water or taking water samples or anything like that. But there was an eagerness and a willing to be part of that process with the landlord. So we decided that even if the landlord maybe wanted to take the entire thing on board or whatever like that, we still wanted a a role in that because we're operating, maintaining the system. Um, so for us, it was just kind of planning for operations always in my mind and engaging those key stakeholders from the very beginning so that they could ask those critical questions along the way and we could address them in the design. Um, and then uh, our building coordinators have joked and you know they they love being part of the process they're all jo they're all vying for who gets to take the first sip of water when we turn it on obviously we're not going to do that but you know it's, it's been great non potable <laughs> reuse uh, yeah so we're not going to do that yeah no but it's been when you have a team that's excited even if they don't necessarily know about it and they're they're joking and they want to be part of it it's it's contagious and you just get a you know you get a lot of people involved and you can really ask those critical questions so um we've got our building coordinators wanting, asking to be involved in the process on the O&M process because they can learn new awesome skill sets. That's great. I know. Thank you. Um, Michael, from your perspective as a technology and maintenance vendor, what sort of training does an operator need? You have a minute and a half. 
Okay, I'll talk really quickly. Um, the, the main thing is the, the level of certification and operator needs is actually dictated by the regulations. But more importantly than that, um, what you want is somebody who understands the nuances of operating a system in a, a building. A, there's going to be more concerns in a building about potential odour or colour of the treated water than you would have at a municipal style treatment system. So understanding the concerns of a developer or a building owner um, is really important when you're going to have an operator for a decentralised system. Uh, you also want them to understand more than anything what the regulatory requirements are, the sampling requirements um, and how the system needs to perform and monitoring and reporting requirements. The reason for all of that is you're running these systems under permits that have been issued to you and you need to stay compliant with those. If you don't, you're not just jeopardizing your system, you're jeopardizing the building because now it has a mandate to be recycling a certain amount of water. So there's a lot of responsibility that comes down being the operator. Um, so really you just need to, to know your game. You need to understand what's required of you and you need to give the, the system the attention it deserves to operate. Thank you, Michael. Um, Amanda from the PUC. <laughs> uh, you told me that to ensure the continued success of the on-site non-potable water system, there's a critical need to develop a, regula uh, a regulator and operator training program. Can you tell me how the PUC is addressing this? Yeah, this is definitely something we're focusing on in 2018. So we're part of this National Blue Ribbon Commission, which is comprised of about 35 representatives from public health agencies, um, water and wastewater utilities from across North America. And their focus really is about removing barriers for on-site water reuse and advancing the field. And one of their missions um, in 2018 is to develop um, an operator regulator training, uh, specifically for on-site non-potable water systems. And so this training um, is actually out for RFP right now. Um, so, and we're hoping to have a program completely developed by the end of this year that we can roll out. But the training program really is trying to focus across the whole spectrum of an on-site water reuse system, not only from um, providing training to designers on what effective treatment trains are, what the monitoring requirements are, but also from the regulators. So our Department of Public Health can understand and evaluate these engineering reports that they receive, that they understand, yep, I know this treatment train is going to be protective of public health. And then finally, this operator training component, um, as Michael said, really giving operators, um, even at the smaller scale, those that um, you know may not have full-time building operators, they're just a facility or maintenance staff, you know, we've seen challenges here in San Francisco even with some of these smaller systems in that operators need to understand, you know, the intent of these systems and be able to understand each of the treatment um, technologies used in that train um, and to be able to operate it um, on a long-term basis. So, and, and additionally, I mean, uh, San Francisco has really led the way um, and now we're looking at from a statewide perspective mm -hmm. This um, uncommon, uh, the Senate Bill 966. So, um, the biggest barriers from, sorry, biggest barrier for municipalities and the public health agencies interested in on site water reuse is the lack of uniform water quality standards and guidance on appropriate oversight. Will you speak to what California Senate Bill 966 is and what it's intended to do? So we're really excited this year um, that SB 966 was introduced by Senator Reiner's office. It's being sponsored by the SFPUC. And really what this bill is intending to do is require the State Water Resources Control Board to establish risk-based water quality standards, monitoring requirements, reporting requirements um, for California. And this is crucial, we think. Um, you know, right now each local jurisdiction has to develop a program. Um, and there's various guidelines on how um, systems are being permitted from San Francisco to LA. And what we want the state to do is establish one standard um, that all systems across California can be designed to. We think it's gonna make it easier for regulators to permit these systems. Um, and we also think it's gonna foster some development among vendors and manufacturers that they're able to design to one standard. Um, so we're really excited about this. But the bill, I will say, um, doesn't do, it doesn't require every community in California to adopt a non-potable water program. You know, we understand that communities that have invested in centralized recycled water systems and infrastructure, um, that's their, that's working for them. It's those that want to actually install or develop a non-potable water program that they're meeting these minimum requirements um, that the state has developed. So we hope that moves forward this year. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, you know, the, the goal of this conversation
conversation was really to kind of start um, kind of at the beginning just a little bit and, and share, you know, where the non-potable water program came from, you know, some of the lessons and insights um, and the education that's needed um, through this process, through a couple, uh, couple projects, um, but then also what we're looking forward to in the future. Um, I apologize we don't have longer time to do Q&A, but we will be getting to that in a second. Um, as discussed earlier in this presentation, education and early engagement is key to the success of incorporating on-site water reuse into your projects. There are resources available that will help. The SFPUC, actually, you know what? I'm going to go to that slide. The SFPUC um, has a ton of resources on their website, uh, and that's uh, sfwater.org slash NP, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Did I get that? You did. Yeah. How in the world did I get that? Um, and then also, additionally, there is the William J. Worthen Foundation's on-site non-potable water reuse practice guide for design professionals. Uh, really, what we were trying to do there is actually take the highly technical information, distill it down to uh, digestible text and easy to understand and read infographics so that anyone, whether you are a client or you're an architect or an engineer, uh, or someone from the Department of Public Health can actually pick up the guide and just become better informed about um, on-site water reuse. And it's so, free. And it's a free download. Yeah, free Yeah, free download at collaborativedesign.org. So um, we are going to open this up to questions. I think we have like five minutes, Ross? Yes. Yep. I mean, we can probably afford maybe two. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I will let you drive. Uh, questions? One, one question that keeps coming to mind is, you know, in the waste stream we find a lot of pharmaceuticals, for example, and you're not likely monitoring for that, right? Or when you're monitoring for things? Yeah. And what kind of implications does not that have? Yeah, not, not directly. We're talking from a supplier side, not a regulator side, um, we're not directly looking at pharmaceutical compounds that are in there. Um, there has been a lot of research done uh, across the world looking at pharmaceutical buildup in treated water and, and how to deal with it. Um, and more and more people are starting to look at different technologies that you can put in there that will remove those compounds. So two that come to mind, which are very good at removing all different um, compounds from treated water is either going to be ozone or um, reverse osmosis. Uh, with a reverse osmosis system, you are removing a lot of the components that could possibly be in there, including those pharmaceuticals that build up. With ozone, an advanced oxidation method, um, you're, you're destroying the compounds as they come through. So designers are looking into that, but I think it's a greater question that we're seeing uh, across the board for um, water treatment and water supply as a whole. And there's still still more to be done, um, but it is something that's on everybody's radar. Question for Amanda is related to the which one? <laughs> the one with the hammer or <laughs> a re the regulator? <laughs> how do you uh, how do you think about technology innovation uh, and when you're setting the regs? There's a lot going on. You have one vendor up here, but you know as a ton of vendors out there yeah. that would love to be up there. Yeah, I mean, we certainly meet with a lot of vendors. Um, we're happy to. You know, we want to learn from this technology as well. Um, and it's a challenging question because at one point we have the public health, you know, hammer that we have that our goal or, you know, the Department of Public Health goal is to protect public health. And while we do want to be innovative when we step, definitely want to support that, we have grant uh, money to be able to do that. We also, at the end of the day, have to feel good about these systems and that we're flushing toilets and spraying this water that we know we're not going to um, prevent any risks or provide any risks to um, customers. So it's a challenge and, you know, I, we're definitely open to it. We're not um, focused in saying that, you know, an MBR is the way you have to go. Um, you just got to prove to us under this new um, risk-based water quality approach that your treatment train as a whole can achieve our targets. And that's really, you know, at the end of the day what we're looking for. How you get there is up to you, but you got to meet these targets. So you all talked a lot about um, planning, uh, education in the planning phases of this. Um, what kind of education and outreach do you do um, to like tenants or residents of the building after the program, after this has been implemented? I'm thinking like one example, um, especially with tenants with pets or whatnot that may use toilets things like that. <laughs> can, can you uh, repeat some of the questions? I don't know if we were able to pick up all of it for the recording there. Can you hear me? I don't know if this is... Oh, I don't want to double do it. Okay. 
Okay, so your question was exactly like the beginning question I had when they came was like, no way are these high end condo owners going to want to know that this is recycled and is it going to stink and what if the kids playing in the toilet and um, it was a part of the education and what we've done now is as I lead the sales team that's meeting with the buyers uh, we've talked about this extensively and educated our sales team so that they could answer those same questions because it's it's the first thing we all think of, right? Like, if you don't know about it, you're like, this is going to... Because at the beginning, people were saying, it's going to look a little off color. Use this other toilet. <laughs> we're not doing that. You, you know, you hear the rumors, and it was the first to go. So you, you, you're you hearing all these kind of weird experiences going, we can't do that. But when it got to the nitty-gritty of it, it wasn't like that at all. Um, and... As Michael has told me, it would be fine if the dog drank some water. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was actually amazing. In the black water system in Blythe, uh, we went in there, and this water's just running. I mean, it's there wasn't a smell in the air. It was just like the clearest water that it's producing. It was actually incredible to see that that actually can happen that way because we're doing gray water and black water is a whole nother ball game and um and it was just it was impressive to see so i think all your questions are valid and seeing is believing again and then having to kind of train that down the down the line is what we're doing for our um for our it's flushing the toilets we're recycling the water and it's being used in the condos so for the tenants down below you know they're excited about it our our tenant is excited that we have a gray water system and um so far surprisingly we haven't had anyone in our um, high-end residential buyers balk at it at all once they get an ed education Um, so we cover the full spectrum from, you know, identifying the system, what kind of conversations you need to have with utilities and regulators and occupants and others. So um, those, those are some of, the, some of the talking points in there as well. Uh, one more question on permitting, just quick. Um, besides San Francisco permitting process, is, is there any state water resources board requirements for approval prior to operating one of these systems or maintaining one of these systems? Uh, when you start looking at the state side, it goes under Title 22. So for, for Blackwater, there is a uh, regulatory pathway for that, and you, you apply at the state level. Um, with Greywater, there's multiple different ones. Typically, um, it goes through you know, the local utility. You'll go speak to them. In LA, for instance, they've got a... Um, a in San Francisco. Just... If you get a Greywater system, you have to... No. Easy answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, I got a question about where where you put the uh, mechanical um, equipment. It's in the lower level, and both the buildings you're demonstrating here are actually in Bay Fill, so it's technically below sea level rise. I actually work with the SFPUC, the Bihar on sea level rise issues, so I'm curious about you know, how does that play into this, particularly thinking uh, hur um, Hurricane Sandy. One of the uh, outcomes of that was you don't want mechanical systems in the basement. So I'm just curious how you address that. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure it was assessed during the permitting phase. Uh, we had to show that the system was sealed and if it leaks, um, where the wastewater is going to go and the quality of it. So it was all assessed um, from a supplier standpoint. Uh, no, we didn't think about that too much. It's part of the greater building and this is why early engagement is important because we'll come in and have these discussions with the greater building team and they'll include it into their permit sets. Um, so it would have been evaluated at some stage. Uh, I can't give too much more insight on that if anybody else can. Sump pumps, we're hoping, <laughs> in, in just minor, um, but we do have sump pumps down in the basement levels around the equipment. I think we've got time for one more question here. Hello. Uh, question as you talk about engaging stakeholders early on, uh, just any experience or feedback on how to navigate questions related to cost slash investment and return on investment. I mean, cutting water use 60% in San Francisco, that's savings on your water bill. I'm curious how to navigate that. 
I think paper. <laughs> Um, so as a supplier, it's probably one of the first questions I get asked when people come and start investigating this is uh, life cycle cost and return of investment. So we have a number of spreadsheets that we've developed uh, that take all that information in that we provide to our potential customers to show them what the system is going to cost them over a 20 year period, uh, what the potential return of investment can be and what they should be aware the outlay for asset replacement, energy cost, all of that is. Um, it's something that we've had to develop and be very open with because us. we're not leaving a project after the system's installed we're going to go on and operate it so we want to make sure that we develop a relationship with the customer who understands what the costs are going to be um, so the information's out there and normally as part of the sales side you, you're able to request that yeah I won't add too much more to that but I, I think actually Amanda Doherty uh, could speak to the um, so we have rate escalation and you can look at the <laughs> Uh, the savings based on rate escalation and the, the water not being used and not being um, paid for in, in the waste stream, but also there's the, the rebate on um, meter sizing, right? Can you okay. speak? Yeah. yeah, I think that would be helpful. Be more appropriate. So we have a capacity charge adjustment for on-site non-potable water systems in San Francisco. So typically when you're doing a new development project, you're assessed a one-time capacity charge for connecting to the water and sewer system in San Francisco, and that's for increased um, capacity for our operations and for maintenance, customer service, things like that. Um, uh, so when you have an on-site non-potable water system, we're only assessing that capacity charge based on um, potable water used for those fixtures. So it's a reduced capacity charge that accounts for on-site non-potable water use. Um, so it, it can significantly reduce your cost for connecting to the system. Just to note that we do install full-size meters because um, we have to always be connected to our city's infrastructure in case your system goes down for maintenance, um, you know, emergency, things like that. We always want to be able to provide you with, you know, your peak demands um, for your building. So there's a little bit of financial incentive for having uh, an on-site non-potable water reuse system, but that's the one-time um, discount, you could say. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I think with that, unfortunately, we have to. Is, is your question really quick? Wait, how okay. many of these uh, permitted sites uh, in Francisco? So the question was how many permitted sites? So we have over 80 plus projects that are in various stages. Um, I think operational, we have about 15 or so that are actually up and running. Up and running. Um, so we have a, a lot more in the pipeline. How many black uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank I want to thank Kyle for putting together this fantastic panel. Thank you so much for moderating. Thank you, everyone. Great, Patrick. Yeah. Thank you.